guys enjoyed the lunch. Uh, we are ready to get started with uh, our first panel for the conference. This panel is on uh, sustainable business practices um, and uh, how it can actually be done in the community and businesses at large, including some activities that the university is doing. I am going to request Dr. Pervez Amal, who is the director of our uh, Center for Sustainable Business Practices in the Cogham College, to come up and introduce uh, our moderator and the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Saurabh. Um, it's really a pleasure um, to have all of you here and pleasure to have our panelists and our moderator. I'll introduce them in a moment. But one of the reasons we put this panel together was, as we heard this morning about sustainability, is sustainability is about you know, interdisciplinary work. It is not just interdisciplinary within the field of business or interdisciplinary within uh, academia, but it is also interdisciplinary in a sense that academics have to talk to business professionals and we have to talk to uh, citizens and we have to talk to government officials because it will the, the scope of the problem is so big and the, and the issues are so urgent and here and now that it does require a broader conversation. It is in that spirit that we put this panel together um, of business leaders in this community uh, who will be sharing their perspectives uh, from their own business experiences and whatever else they want to share with us. And to moderate this panel we have our president who has been a champion on these issues, both on the campus and even in his previous job as the mayor of our city. Um, and so, I don't think so I need to introduce John Delaney to this audience. So John, can you please come up? Um, and also, let me uh, quickly introduce some of our, uh, the four of our panelists. Our first panelist is uh, Rhodes Robinson. Um, Rhodes is president of Environmental Services Incorporated. Uh, it is headquartered in Jacksonville. Um, and the firm deals with a variety of natural resource issues, including UNF master plan and controlled burns for indigenous natural areas on campus, uh, Better Jacksonville plan, Nocati, and many other things. Um, Mr. Robinson serves on Dean's Leadership Council for the College of Arts and Sciences at UNF. Um, this, uh, Rhodes, can you please come up? <clears throat> Our second panelist is uh, Rodney McLaughlin. Uh, Rodney is founder and board member for Legacy Trust Company, a multifamily office wealth management firm headquartered right here in Ponte Vedra. Uh, he earned his MBA from the Wharton School, um, and he also serves on the board of advisors for Wharton. Rodney? Um, <clears throat> Our third panelist is uh, Rob Overly. Um, Rob is a registered architect whose professional experiences has ranged from working on sustainable projects as represented by his involvement in lead project administrator at the Jacksonville University Marine Science Research Institute. Um, Rob. And finally, um, we have Mark Falvo. Mark um, is a fellow academic here. He's a graduate of um, Boston College. Um, and he is currently UNF's, uh, the director for UNF's Center for Community-Based Learning and coordinator of UNF's Quality Enhancement Plan on community-based transformation and learning. I'm sure you'll all enjoy the conversation, and let me turn it over to John, and as John is all in. Okay, let me take this one, we'll spread it on. Right? Thank you, Parvez, and I appreciate uh, yours and your colleagues and the college's efforts in putting this together. It's, uh, uh, we're delighted to have it in this setting. Uh, as Parvez mentioned, this university's long had a, a green orientation. Um, and uh, uh, in fact, all of our buildings that have been built in the last 10 years have been uh, certified some standard of LEED. Um, but this dimension is a little bit different. We tend to think of kind of biology and, and, uh, and botany when, we, when I tend to think of environmentalism, but it's extended into some other areas that it can be impacted directly by, uh, by business practices. And I wanted to kind of first walk down the panel and um, if there's some things about their personal background they'd like to make sure is, is added um, uh, and makes kind of introductory comments. So Rose, let's just start with you. Um, I am the uh, CEO of a local environmental consulting firm and we deal with natural resources 
historically all over the southeastern United States, but several years ago, um, our foresters approached me and um, wanted to get into uh, a new area related to uh, carbon sequestration, which intermeshes with what we're talking about today. It's a small uh, part of the issue, um, but we jumped into that um, deeper than what I thought we were going to do. Um, and we earned some credentials over a couple of years' time, uh, the major one being from the American National Standards Institute. Um, and when we got through with that, we found out that we were one of four com companies in the world that were certified to do uh, verification of forest uh, carbon sequestration projects. We posted that uh, on our webpage, and within a month, we began getting calls literally from all over the world. And so this little consulting firm here in Jacksonville uh, began sending people all over the world, uh, Africa, India, uh, South America, Canada, all over the United States, um, and we're still doing that. Um, and um, one of the things that's happening is that um, in tropical areas, primarily, uh, rainforests are under enormous threat uh, to be uh, cut down and converted into agriculture or just cut down and sold for timber. Those uh, rainforests uh, are also extremely valuable for cleaning up the atmosphere and assimilating uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, and so methodologies have been developed to um, provide carbon credits, carbon offsets for other projects for preserving those forests. And what we do is we go behind the developers and verify that the, the carbon biomass uh, is there and the protection mechanisms are there and that they are being implemented properly. It's a fascinating business, it's a fascinating places we go. We just have two people that got back from Africa, they were in such a remote spot and for 15 days they were effectively camping out with the lions and the cobras uh, because there was no hotel to get to. Um, but it's very interesting, it's, it's a piece of the, the whole picture and we probably will talk more about that later. Okay, thanks. Uh, two of the places that his firm has been is Tasmania and New Guinea, so he really has sort of uh, gone across the world. And Rodney's an old friend of mine, and Rodney, you've also trans transversed uh, a good uh, segment of the world, and, and uh, uh, why don't you kind of round out a little bit more your background as well for the group. Okay, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, my name is Rodney McLaughlin, and uh, as uh, you know, Professor Pavis Ahmed mentioned early on, you know, I'm one of the founders of Legacy Trust Company, which is uh, today one of the largest independent trust companies in the state of Florida, and it's 11 years old. And it's sort of interesting, you know, uh, when you think about sustainability, you know, how does a wealth management firm uh, fit into the picture because after all we're not like a GE uh, so lowering the temperature from 75 to 72 degrees in our offices is not really going to make a, a significant difference but uh, what we have found out is that uh, when you look at our various constituencies and you know the key ones are our shareholders obviously our clients our employees you know our, the community that we live in you know our regulators because we're a regulated entity and also our vendors is that you know sustainability is very critical and it touches each of those different constituencies. Um, I'll just pick one and we can talk about it a little more later. But take employees for example. You know we're going to attract really talented and quality employees. You know and, and attract the sort of the, the millennium uh, population. We are going to have to be very sensitive in everything that we do and everything that we touch as far as sustainability is concerned because that is certainly something that's very important to them when they make a choice of where to work. Uh, and and we, we do all the basic uh, things, you know, like for example, we're a paperless company, uh, you know, we, we use the cloud very effectively in terms of transmitting data to all our clients. But at the end of the day, if you look at the brand enhancement uh, for the firm, uh, and I was sharing this uh, at lunch today, the, the area that, that has the greatest impact is that we as an institution, not only corporate-wise, but also when we go ahead and sort of select our clients, 
Uh, philanthropy is very, very critical. It is probably the most critical uh, ingredient. And we make sure, you know, it's a classic, you know, a lot of, a lot of literature has been written about this, about the sort of the hands up and the hands out. And uh, we're very careful in that respect, and we really emphasize, you know, charities, and so do our clients, that are hands up oriented as opposed to hands out. We don't want to create, you know, a, a sort of a, a climate, you know, of uh, expectation, of, uh, of basically people expecting, you know, to receive charity, which goes into a dependency factor. So, um, so that's one of the areas that we touch. We also touch uh, when, when we select the managers who, uh, you know, manage the different segments uh, of, a, of an investor's portfolio. You know, what type of criteria do they utilize? And uh, enough literature has been said that those companies that are clearly focused on, on green, that focus on sustainability, you know, enhance their profitability, enhance their brand. So obviously they're great stocks to invest in. And so that's another way that we touch, you know, as a wealth management firm. So, I mean, there's some other examples that we can talk a little bit later, but um, the other company, I, I sit on a few boards, and one of the companies which I think is also very interesting because it's in the, in the uh, cellulose business. As a matter of fact, it's a competitor of Rio Near here in town, and their largest operation is down in Brazil. And of course, they're highly dependent on the eucalyptus, and I can share a little bit about what they do in that area of social responsibility, which uh, again, is very critical to them because in today's environment, uh, particularly a company of that size, if they don't meet certain criteria, you know, it's very difficult for them to get something as basic as a financing. You know, the, the large banks today are requiring, you know, that uh, a lot of the, the regulation, a lot of the certifications, you know, that the company has to have in order to be eligible for a financing. So, anyway, that's a little bit of background. Okay, and then also Rodney uh, served on the university's uh, foundation board for a while, so he's very familiar here. He's been, been he and his wife have been good to the campus. Rob, uh, you're our panel architect, uh, and uh, the the only thing I winced at when Parvez introduced you was that you did a building at Jacksonville University. We're not allowed to say that word on this campus, uh, but uh, but it's a gorgeous building. I have to say that I'm very very jealous. So, well, actually. Um that might lead into another conversation we have later on about a joint relationship between JU and UNF. But uh, as you notice, I'm I'm a lead AP. Well, that's the the jargon, I'm, which implies I'm a member of the United States Green Building Council. Uh, through my activities, I've also uh, been involved with the American Planning Association and the Urban Land Institute on sustainable communities. So I've done a lot of both lecturing, uh, developing workshops with the the city. Very tied very closely to uh, planning department, a good friend of mine, Bill Killingsworth. But unfortunately, he's leaving the city of Jacksonville right now, which is really a shame. Um, been involved with uh, what's referred to as transitory development um, planning, uh, overlays, and things like that. Um, there's a side of me that's a shadow that a lot of my friends know about, and not many people do, except my friends. Uh, I'm, I live a shadow life. I'm also, through Rotary, I'm involved in water and sanitation projects in developing countries, and I've been doing it for over 12 years. And the biggest issue Rotary has is really trying to make those programs sustainable. You know, the, the rationale basically is as Rotarians, we have a tendency with our Western ideologues to go into a country and do this really whiz-bang one-day wonder and get our photo ops, whether it's a drilling well or whatever, walk away, and two years later on down the line, those products fall apart. So as a member of the, uh, well, I shall also mention, I'm also a member of the uh, Rotary's Water and Sanitation Action Group. Uh, which is actually a, a large net, international network of uh, experts that uh, are offered to clubs doing um, service products internationally. Uh, they include engineers, architects, educators, uh, colleges, and things like that. My takeaway from doing like my projects on an international basis and doing it in developing countries is, I'm, and my obsession with sustainability is, there's a lot of analogies between doing work in developing countries and coming back to the United States where it, there's huge issues about sustainability. And, uh, and understanding that one of the biggest issues in sustainability is changing the cultural paradigm. It's really getting people to understand what the problem is and how to address it, especially when they're so entrenched culturally and doing something a certain way. And I think that's one of the issues we face uh, today as a society. With that, we'll go to Mark, Mark Falbo, who uh, is leading our efforts of community engagement connecting the university and our students uh, as part of their learning process with the 
the communities. Mark, a couple comments, and maybe a background item we missed uh, sure, in your thanks. introduction. Thanks. Uh, well, I guess the background item is I come to this not simply as an academic, although I guess my role, because these are very you know, nice gentlemen who are not averse to conflict, but, but I guess that's the academic role is to be the gadfly. Um, but my, my, essentially, I come to this uh, having worked in uh, not only the academy, but also bringing students to uh, international experiences, uh, community service trips down to Nicaragua, El Salvador just after the war, and uh, as far away as Kenya. So I, I sit on a small NGO that uh, pro you know, provides about a half a million dollars of funding to uh, small groups uh, throughout uh, uh, the globe, all over the globe. Um, so I'm, I'm bringing that perspective around the issue and challenge of sustainability because as an academic, uh, you know, my understanding is that one of the ways we look at sustainability is not just environmental, which is very important. If we don't have the basics of clean air, water, uh, and, and a healthy earth, um, then it's going to be very difficult for us to think about all the other things and hopes we, we have as human beings. Uh, also capital, because, you know, if for some reason we're not able to have a good, you know, a su su sufficient flow of capital, uh, then it's going to be hard to sustain the well-being not only of ourselves, but certainly of the earth. Um, but I come to it as, as an academic, so I, I see uh, uh, human beings, uh, potential employees, our employees, uh, our students as part of the sustainable challenge. And, and I'm going to start off with the gadfly part because it is after lunch and I can, you know, probably you're, you know, I'm the last guy, so you're sort of nodding off a little bit. But I want to make the, make the case uh, that uh, essentially we don't have a crisis in education here, but we have a crisis in schooling. And the problem is, is that the model of schooling is a very linear model that cannot sustain and it cannot produce the kind of, edu uh, kind of students that we need uh, for, a, uh, for the, the coming future that we have. Um, we have one that's basically designed around a manufacturing model, students in, students out. Um, but what we need uh, to be sustainable is to how do we pr uh, produce and educate um, students who will be resilient in a changing economy, who will be innovative, will be adaptive, uh, because the kinds of, of issues that they will be facing are, are, are different than any, any previous generation had. So to do that, I want to say the one way we do that, and there's many ways that we do it at, at UNF, uh, but fortunately we have had a history not only of engagement as a, as a university with our community, uh, we also have a, a history of transformational learning initiatives. Um, and then you start putting them together, you know, our interest in community-based learning, uh, you know, being in the community, being in real time, uh, in real situations, and you have the opportunity of transformational learning where we provide resources to faculty to do innovative activities, whether it's study abroad, uh, whether it's actually uh, research. Uh, we've got some really uh, interesting innovative research pieces that are not only coming out of um, uh, here in the, the College of Business, but also in the, in the College of in, in, uh, Computing, Engineering, and Instruction Management. We also had the opportunity of some of our departments to have flagship money, and, and some departments like our School of Nursing have literally uh, kind of reversed the paradigm. They've done a, a kind of a flipped classroom where students are engaged in home-based locations throughout the city of Jacksonville who are responding to real issues in those communities, in those neighborhoods. And in return, there's these, our students are also learning how to uh, not just be good nurses, but be good citizens, uh, be people who have intercultural competence, uh, be people who have, uh, are people of character, uh, and, have, and see the integrated connections between their learning. So we're, I'm fortunate to be part of that larger process. We have over 107 faculty uh, who have gone through uh, intentionally uh, you know, course redesign and tried to in, in, incorporate community-based learning into their courses. But I think the, the big piece about that, and I could be happy to talk more about those specific stories because there are many great case examples that I could pull out and I don't have much, that, that much time. Uh, but the important part is that through these experiences, it's not enough just to have disciplinary competence these days. It's not enough. We have to have students who are resilient, who can respond creatively, imaginatively, heroically to the challenges that they will face. And some of that can be done in the classroom, but most of that can be done by active engagement in real time with real issues and real challenges under the guidance and support of, of, of colleagues who are their teachers, instructors, and researchers. So I think I'll leave it at that.
Okay. Well, we're going to come. We're going to kind of bounce around a little bit, and uh, uh, why don't we leave one mic on this end, and we'll leave the other down there, and uh, so you two on each each side can sort of share it. Um, I'd like to start with Rodney. Um, uh, Mark made a comment about uh, you know business practices, and I think it sh should be on. Is that one on? Just tap it. Hello. Yep. Okay, that one's working. Um, Rodney, what are, what are you seeing in terms of corporate strategies? Uh, again, you're you're a, an investor, and you invest client money, um, and so you know the, the, the paradigm responsibility is for uh, the paramount responsibility is for return, investment returns. But what else are you seeing, um, and and how how what percentage of your clients are looking for uh, investing in um, socially responsible stocks, or that's the label kind of the buzzword now. Um, you know. Surprisingly, I guess in one way, you know, a large amount of our clients are looking at that. Uh, and part of it, of course, is, is uh, intuitive on, on, at their end, which is those are the companies that perform extremely well, are very profitable, and the returns, the returns are there. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's like in their own self-interest that they go ahead and, and do that. Uh, but we also see, as I mentioned early on, we, I, we also see that not only our shareholders, but also you know our employees are very much connected in that in that area. Because if we succeed, and again the success of Legacy is is pretty straightforward. Uh, legacy is Legacy Trust. Your legacy company. Trust, right? I mean, you know the the performance has to be there in terms of the asset management, and so and that's how we get that's how we get rewarded. And so by selecting the right companies and selecting those that are focused in, in um, economic sustainability, the returns are going to be greater. That's how we're going to get rewarded. And quite candidly, that's how we're going to retain, retain our employees. So it's sort of a vicious circle, you know, pretty incestuous, but, but a positive one uh, in that respect. Well, what are you seeing in, in uh, just two, two more questions, and then we'll bounce around, I'm going to come back over to Rhodes. Uh, what are you seeing corporations do in terms of sustainability? If you can give a couple of examples, and then, do you have or what percentage, roughly, of your clients put uh, investing in socially responsible companies even slightly ahead of returns? Do you have have many of those? Uh, I'll answer the, the the second question, which is a little easier. Uh, I haven't come across those yet. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm sure they're out there, but I haven't come across them. We, 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 we're being urged by some to uh, put that as the first responsibility, but our foundation has yeah, well, got the fiduciary you know, Nothing team. like being blunt, right? Uh, so, so, no question. I'm sorry. What was your, your first of all, what, what practices are you seeing, say, individual companies? Yeah, and, and so, uh, you know, why don't I just use as an example, uh, you know, the company that I'm affiliated with, uh, which has a huge operation in, in Brazil. And, uh, you know, they're highly dependent on eucalyptus plantation. You know, that's the raw material for their end product. And, and they do specialty cellulose, which, again, competes with real near here in town. And the main, it's sort of the major ingredient, uh, uh, ingredient for things like uh, uh, filters for cigarettes, you know, uh, LED screens for, for TVs, high-performance tires, etc. So here you are, you know, you're sort of in the, in the semi-jungle in, in Brazil, and you've got these 150,000 hectares of uh, eucalyptus plantation. And one of the, uh, from a profitability standpoint, one of the issues, you know, that they have, which is a very major issue, is theft. Because, you know, these, these uh, plantations are spread all over the, all over the region. Uh, you know, the, the radius is, is pretty, you know, it's probably 100, 150 miles. So, I mean, it's a pretty significant radius. You, you can't have enough people to 27, you know, 24 7 to, um, you know, to inspect those properties and, and to protect them. And so, how are you going to get the buy in? And the only way you're going to get the buy in, and, and, and again, it's a very corrupt environment. You know, the, the police is in cahoots with, with, with the local you know, the thieves, and, and it's not only at the state level, but it goes all the way up to the, uh, up to the federal level. And, and it's dangerous. I mean, people get killed. I mean, so, so you've got a safety issue and you've got the theft issue. And so what the company has done very effectively is invested in schools and hospitals for the local communities because it, it's creating a sort of an interdependency between the company and those communities in terms of the health and the education and, and those individuals are then, because they have a vested interest in the success of the company, you know, our first line of defense, as 
far as that. So that's sort of a very concrete example where it is in the mutual interest of all parties involved. It's great for the villagers because they're getting resources, they're getting education, they're getting you know health services that they otherwise wouldn't get. And obviously it's great for the company because uh, it, you know they don't have as much theft as they otherwise would need. Great, thanks. Let's, let's kind of with that geography jump to you, Rhodes, that you've mentioned uh, that, that you know your, your company is now in a lot of different countries across the globe. Um, where is the interest of New Guinea for the carbon sequestration, for the sustainability, you know, th th that's a country that's not, I wouldn't describe it as a wealthy place, uh, and often survival is sort of the, the operative uh, uh, processes. What, what's going on there? Uh, the carbon sequestration um, occurs most uh, naturally in highly productive forest, which is uh, a, a band of forest that more or less parallels the equator, uh, tropical forest uh, around the center of the earth, Amazon rainforest, uh, the rainforest of Southeast Asia, and those uh, of the Congo River Basin in Africa. It's where the trees are six or eight feet in diameter, or two or three hundred feet high. Uh, and enormous amounts of carbon are stored in those trees uh, and processed out of the atmosphere. Um, and also, uh, because the, the economies are undeveloped, the land is cheap. Uh, and the land can be acquired cheaply. Um, and when that happens, it can be acquired, it, and it can be protected cheaply and when that happens when you go through the process of demonstrating sequestration and protection for an extended period of time 30 years at the minimum then you earn carbon credits from that that can be sold uh, globally uh, the global warming atmospheric issues are uh, not counted or not locked in by political boundaries it's a global issue and so you can do something good for the environment in Brazil and offset impacts in Great Britain or Canada or the USA. So that's what's going on in New, in New Guinea. Uh, the, the land is cheap and accessible and the same thing in Africa and uh, other places. In time, as the pressure increases, those resources will become more valuable and the cost of the sequestration will uh, increase and uh, it will have e economic impacts. Um, while I've got this, I, I would like to um, offer a comment about, uh, I, I know this conference is, is about uh, economic sustainability. Um, I'm the ecologist up here and I want to at least plant a seed to, to think about this as uh, it is a broader issue and most of the um, models of sustainability talk about um, the old concept is triple bottom line but you, you got to have um, uh, consideration for people planet and economy they all have to come together in harmony and it's like a venn diagram and that little bit in the middle that sweet spot is where it really works and so uh, it can't all be about the economy, it can't all be about the environment, and it can't all be about the people. It's where they all come together, and that's really the complexity. If you think about the United States, China, where we're highly industrialized, we have one set of issues. If you go to Africa, South America, they won't be like us. They could care less about the environment, they want to grow up. And we're interested in protecting their environment, so there's lots of there's lots of really major issues, and the, um, the big picture is, if, if we go back to when we were walking on the moon and looked at Earth, that's really what the picture is for us to deal with. But when we get down to the macro level, we got to solve all these little local political issues to, to make the, the Earth sustainable, and it, it's really a big, a big complex uh, nut for us to, to crack and deal with over time. Well, let's stick with that for just a minute then. The, uh, 
going back to the Amazon where I don't know how many hundred thousand acres are getting um, converted to farmland, either burned or timbered, and um, in those uh, big oxygen producing trees that are sucking in the carbon dioxide. How do you deal with a farmer there that, that, that is interested in taking care of the family? Um, you know, how, how do you get that trade off and, and you end up with a situation like Rodney's describing where whether they own the land or not, <laughs> they still may be going in there to try to get something going because it's just so huge and massive, it, it's hard to patrol. Well, one of, the, one of the things that is happening with uh, carbon sequestration uh, projects um, uh, around the world, uh, you'll see it in the newspaper, you'll see it referred to as um, red, capital R, capital E, capital D, capital D. Um, basically, it's a preservation of uh, mature forest. And there's, there's, there's kind of two pieces to that. There's one is the basic preservation, which you can earn carbon credits. There's an interesting... It's just like a wetlands credit, that if you build on a wetland, you kind of buy, mm -hmm. and buy you, something someplace else and, and save and it. You, and you preserve it. Um, there's great interest now on something called Red Plus, in which the preservation has a social element added to that. And the project developers, um, we're working on one in the Democratic Republic of the Congo right now that's it's over a million acres of contiguous land. Uh, and it has a few thousand people living underneath the trees. As about, part, how many, about how many acres are Florida? Do you have that off the top of your head? Or can you equate a million acres um, into some? It would, it would be um, something below uh, Lake Okeechobee. Below Lake Okeechobee is about five million acres, so it's, it is a big chunk of land. It's, it's a lot larger than Duval County. Um, it's big. Um, no roads, no airports, no nothing. It's pristine. But there are um, a number of small uh, native villages. But the, the Red Plus uh, part of the project is that the project developer is preserving the trees and is going to warrant that they're not going to be cut for a period of 30 years. But along with that, and from part of the money that he earns, he's going to invest that back into the local communities. He's going to help those people find alternative ways of living to protect their lifestyles, uh, if that's what they want. Um, and that's called Red Plus. That's the social element. And the interesting thing is that people buying the credits will, put, will pay a 15% premium to get that extra because when, they, when the oil company runs their ad in the magazine, they can talk about all the social good they're doing from their uh, carbon credits uh, for the local people just besides saving trees. So that, that's going on, that's, that's the way a lot of people are dealing with the uh, local economy and um, when carbon sequestration started, the, the, the first really major projects were in Brazil in the rainforest and um, you might have seen it on 60 Minutes, there was an expose and it was really ugly because they were running the native people off of the land that they had lived on and inherited for generations because part of their lifestyle was to clear an acre and, and uh, plant their garden and when that got unproductive they'd move to somewhere else and the trees would grow back up and they'd go somewhere else. Um, and so that got, a, that got a real black eye and then somebody came up with this uh, other approach and that, that's how we're dealing with it there. Okay, sounds good. Rob, uh, it, it a couple of years ago, the Coggin College had a, um, um, a session much like this um, that was in conjunction with the Rotary that talked about water. And, um, you know, really it's only in the last century that hunger was no longer an issue in the average American's life. Um, but in the rest of the world, that's still an issue. But, but it really pointed out to me something, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised, but uh, the vast swath of the globe that really doesn't have access to clean water. And uh, the example was, well-meaning citizens would go in, you alluded to it, put in a well, but the parts would break, and every well would have a different type of a well or a pumping system, and, um, and Rotary's trying to work 
work to do to uh, make fresh, clean water available to the entire world. Do you want to give a little bit more background on that? Well, actually, um, water is, you know, we always, it's, it's funny when we talk about other, other countries. Um, water is not just an international problem. It's also here. Uh, you know, I've been to two World Water Forums. One was in Mexico City a while back, then Istanbul. And the World Water Forum is a uh, number of both governmental agencies and non-governmental governmental agencies, uh, United Nations is involved. Rotary is a big player in that. Um, and what you learn is there's issues about potable water for developing countries, but also water for agriculture, cross-border water disputes. They're being huge nowadays. Uh, climate change, global sea level rise, those type of issues. The reality is, is that water is becoming almost coming right up in front of the list at, at a number of different levels. One is basically unsustainable agricultural practices. And by the way, that's here too. It's not just saying, oh, it's those guys in India or whatever. It's really the United States and how we do it. We actually have exported our, our technologies to India, the Green Revolution. We were actually teaching them unsustainable practices that actually have caused a lot of um, depletion in their aquifers. Um, issues regarding uh, cross-border water disputes, uh, various countries uh, come to mind, Turkey, Iraq, Syria. And, and by the way, that's here again here. If you, if you really read your newspapers, uh, what you're finding out is uh, very locally between the uh, state of Georgia, Alabama, and Florida, you've got the Flint, Apalachicola River issues. And everybody's fighting over the water quality there. Right now, if you've again been watching the news, um, the Army Corps of Engineers is tasked with dredging a section of the Mississippi River from um, from um, Cairo, Illinois, to St. Louis to make it navigable because the river is dropping in the same, in, in uh, Mississippi River. Um, we're starting to see a lot of issues, and it's not just potable water. And, and the problem, too, is, is the way we treat our water resource. Yes, it is a cyclical issue, but the problem is we're polluting it at a rapid rate. We're starting to see, and this gets down to demographic shifts and all that, we're seeing countries with very large populations that rely on water coming from glacial melt. And when I say that, I'm referring to India and China. We've got a lot of here. And what we're seeing is, as the, the uh, glaciers melt really quick, we're seeing very large countries that have to deal with a depleting resource. And what do you do? And what do you do when you've got two of the larger populations in, in the world uh, struggling? And by the way, now China's an economic uh, competitor of ours. And they're going to Brazil, to South America, and to places like South and into Africa looking for resources, whether it's agricultural resources or water issues and stuff like that. Uh, they're going in there. So those issues like that. Global well, sea level rises and the other issues affecting the Maldives. Um, you actually see a, a country in, in, in the Maldives that um, is actually buying up property because they know they're going to have a totally displaced population pretty soon as they see the sea level rise. Bangladesh is the same way. Right now, India is building a wall to keep the Bangladesh Bangladeshis out of India because they're seeing uh, that river, that whole uh, delta, rise. I mean, it, it, it's a, a, an issue. So, you know, when we talk about rotary, it's, it's more than a potable water issue. The water really spans a very, very large spectrum. And, and even some of the comments about, well, don't worry about what we'll do to desalinization plants. Desal is heavy on energy, very large on pollution. And it's economically not very viable. Especially when you talk about trying to not only match providing a water for a population, but also providing water for the biggest end use, which is agriculture. So we're, we're starting to see at, at Rotary's issue, uh, we're working with Rotary and going through these water forms and all that stuff, we're starting to see a, a resource, along with farming, by the way, that food and water has become a huge issue. And, and from that, it's not just the agriculture side, we're seeing the potential for some, some huge demographic shifts. So even if it might be okay here, we think, or in a country, we're starting to see uh, demographic shifts from other countries that are affected by the water. Well, let's just stick with Florida for a minute. You know, we get four to five feet of rainwater every year. Um, a slug of that runs off to the, to the ocean. Um, you know, and, and, and often it is indeed cyclical. Um, but we really treat, we give the water away as, as the state of Florida. Um, you know, you get a permit to pump it up from underneath. We've got Zephyr Hills that pumps it up and sells it. 
um, there's some within this water management district that have said there really ought to be, you know, if it was oil or uranium, uh, that there'd be, uh, you know, fees paid to the, the people of the state, uh, much like uh, the Forest Service will do when it uh, allows timber, even though it's steeply discounted. Kind of what you're thinking about that? Well, if, if you really watch um, the media, there, there have been comments about water being the next oil. As a matter of fact, an individual that had speculated on oil, Warren Buffett, is seeing that as really being the case. And he's actually buying up a lot of uh, land around aquifers in Texas to, with the idea of actually using this as a, a commodity that's for profit. And um, Before gas made its run-up a few years ago, if you went to a 7-Eleven, it was actually, the water was more expensive if you'd buy it out of a bottle than the gas was. Would you, would you think about this? This is something where we, we sit on, um, um, probably one of the largest aquifers, and hopefully it's still one of the largest aquifers in, 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 the, in the country, and yet we water our lawns with bottled water. Well, essentially, it's bottled water. I mean, we actually, you know, when we have to turn our sprinkler on, we actually go into, uh, for JEA, a lot of JEA, JEA's water, it comes from the aquifer. And we have a very, and it's, it's funny for us, and this is the irony for us. We, you know, a while back, you probably have read the dis disputes between North Florida and Central Florida about the, uh, the use of St. John's River for potable water supply because what was occurring at the time was that uh, Orlando and those areas were seeing uh, the, um, the aquifer being drawn down at an unsustainable rate. They were looking for options in the St. John's River water management. The idea was to go to the Getting St. sinkholes because the water was gone, so the land was collapsing in Orlando. Right, but the idea was to go to either the St. John's River or the, and the Oklahoma. And we panicked. We said, you know, you can't do this. This is our resource. The whole issue between what's, how it's going to affect the mouth of the river, what's going to affect, how it's going to affect the salinity of the river, the hydrology of the river, and all that stuff. Uh, the, the reality is, is that Orlando has a, a better pur purple pipe program than we do. Does everybody know what a purple pipe program is? It's, it's a gray water. It's actually recycled water. So here we are in Jacksonville. Thumbing our noses at Orlando and Central Florida saying, you can't do this to our water, yet we have a a program that's less sustainable than they are. So where's the justice in that? But what, why do they get it just because they've tapped up their resources first? I mean, doesn't the water belongs to the state? Why do they get to stick the straw in it first? It, the, the, the aquifer is not, it's not a closed system. It's, an, it's a relatively open system. So they're tapping to, you know, depending on where you're at. I think they're still, it's above the, the um, the Okeechobee, Lake Okeechobee is where they're using the same aquifer that we are. When you get south, then it's Miami's water and that, that one area. It's the way the hydrology works. It's the Florida and Alcantara, it's a, right? Well, except in South Florida, it's not. Right. It's a little different. But, but um, so really, they're, they're a larger population, and uh, they're seeing the needs. And we're a smaller population, so on a per capita basis, who, who's less sustainable? And that, that's really the issue. So yet, we've experienced a lot of growth and population in say Florida around Central Florida. So on a per capita basis, we have to check the numbers, but I, I don't think it's, we can't point our fingers and say, well, you're drawing water. I, I think in reality, I, I think they're drawing less potable water than we are. They're actually, they've got, like I said, they've got a, a larger uh, purple pipe or gray water system than we do. And, and, and I but think- less ag, it's pretty yeah, good. less ag and less timber. That's right. um, what, what about the desal? Um, going back to price, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't market dictate more conservation? In other words, if you pay for water, what it costs? And again, in, in effect, what the regulators have done is given to the utilities the authority to pump to certain limits, but they get that water for free. They don't have to pay a, uh, pay a fee for taking the state's water. I think the fear is that we're going to cost some water, cost of resource. And really, quite frankly, that's the problem with, you know, it's almost a a soapbox for me is we are we we have been so blessed with very large resources we see everything as being a free and and, and an entitlement uh, whether it's land or whatever we, we grew up as a nation in the industrial age where we were used to a certain methodology and we were used to a lot of resources and we didn't really value the resource like a European country where they really saw the need for conservation if you if you want to talk about who's probably one of the more aggressive countries in terms of water it's the Netherlands. Very impressive. They, they better be. <laughs> well, they, they, they well, oddly enough, they actually, I was talking to an engineer in the, uh, the water form in Istanbul. They have a program to be responsive to a 10,000 year event. Well, you know, as an architect, I deal, deal with 100 year events. What in the world is a 10,000 year event? Well, sea level rise. 
and there is a country they're very aggressive on. Rhodes, it looks like you've been you've been chomping at the bit there for a minute. Uh, uh, just a, a comment about uh, Central Florida and their um, their situation is, is different th than ours, but they're they're close when we're talking about global issues. Uh, the three water management districts that serve Central uh, Florida uh, got together two years ago and they made a decision not to issue after this year any additional groundwater withdrawal in Central Florida. That's their water supply. They don't have surficial water. Uh, they're not going to get a whole lot out of, out of the St. John's River. They're going to get some. Um, and the managers at the Water Management District, and I've had this conversation with them on several projects, uh, they say in 25 years, most of Florida will get most of its fresh water from the ocean and deep south. Just because we keep pulling it out of the ground. Uh, in Central Florida, as we just heard, they're depleting the groundwater, and the groundwater table keeps getting lower and lower, and that's sending us a message. We don't have sustainability in water, which is vital uh, for, for the people. Um, so we got to have alternative solutions, and even though it appears to be abundant, it, it isn't in that area, and it is a, a, a very substantial issue, and it's close to us. We have a little bit different situation in, in uh, northeast Florida, uh, but uh, central Florida is just 100 miles from us. It's just, it's close. And those kind of issues are just associated with people and space and limited resources. At some point, we just get to a point where we're maxed out. And, and really, part of this is also land planning. Uh, and, and when you make a comment about cheap agricultural land, and, and, and I couldn't help but think about that, because the way we, we, we are very reactive in our, our, our land planning in the United States compared to, again, to the Netherlands or whatever. Uh, quite frankly, a developer sees agricultural land as very cheap land. And it's very easy for them to purchase that land in large quantities, go to a planning department, rezone it, have the expectation that the city is going to provide infrastructure and services to that area. What's interesting, we were talking ecology a while back. We're at a point right now where it's no longer an ecological issue, it's an economic issue. Because and you, you hear the news, city council is wrestling with their budgets. Well, the reality is, I would, and, and I'm, I'm, obviously I'm biased by my profession, but it's because of the way we build. We build very unsustainable urban patterns. They're untenable. Right now, uh, the DOT, and you might, you've actually heard, I've been saying this for a long time, so I'm involved in the master plan for Cecil Commerce Center. The DOT is going bankrupt. JTA doesn't have any money. So how are they going to maintain their roads and all that stuff? Well, they already pretty much gave you a hint yesterday, I think, in the news. They called it user fees. You're going to have an express lane. Isn't that going to be great? An express lane lane on, on your major arterials, 95, 10, and all that stuff. That express lane is a toll road. And the rationale basically is, is if you live in the suburbs, the cost of living for you, a large percentage of your cost of living is going to go to moving around both the cost of fuel, gas, the car itself, and using the roads. And as we grow and we talk about water, we don't talk about how we're impacting the natural systems. Are we building pervious, or yeah, so I'm sorry, impervious services and a recharge area for the aquifer? We don't talk about those issues. Now, quite frankly, again, to Central Florida's credit, they did do a study that based on that it was on both uh, transportation and land planning. And, uh, I guess I can only soapbox again. We have a, we've had for a while a disconnect between transportation and land planning. There was really no logic. We just did land planning and we expected to move the streets to that area. Very, very unsustainable. And somehow we got to get back and we, we complain about buses. Well, the reality is, quite frankly, a good mass uh, transportation system relies on a certain density. It's usually the, the sweet spots between 8 to 12, 14 units per acre. That makes it work. That's the market. That's their catchment to make that a viable thing. We used to brag when I was a kid growing up that we're the largest city by, by land area in, in the United States. Well, that's our Achilles heel. 
because we don't have the densities to support a sustainable urban pattern. And the same thing applies to agriculture and all that. Well, let, let's kick that around a little bit. Um, and I'll just devil's advocate on a few of these things that, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we fought a revolution to be able to own stuff and, and not have it in the name of the king. And, um, and we, we, until the recession, we had a thousand people a day moving into Florida. We're now back up to 250,000 people per year. Um, how do you how do you keep them stop from coming? You know, I, I had I had four kids and three of them were out of the house, thank God. Uh, they, and I wanted to live near I wanted to live in Jacksonville. In other words, population growth. How can you reconcile population growth? Um, it, property rights, and the type of planning that you're talking about. Well, you're talking about property rights. That, that's probably the biggest issue. Um, growth really is, 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 is actually incentivizing growth where you get density. A disincentivizing where you don't have the density to support the, the infrastructure. You've got to, um, our biggest problem is, I think, is as we quote, attract businesses, we try to make things very cheap for that. The we provide these incentives, we get in this land way out in the middle of nowhere, and we try to bring the infrastructure. The reality is, we can't afford to do that. Well, what infrastructure are you talking about? Those, they, can't, they can't do it if they don't have water and sewer anyway. You're, you're, you're right. You're, it's roads. It's also fire, school. I mean, think about it. When you, when you build a Palencia out there in the middle of nowhere, all of a sudden you're going to go to the school board and say, I want a school. Just to keep you on the, the Palencia is a housing development. It's, yes. not, it's not a business that the, the city is no, no, incentivized. But, 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 Oh, you're right, but it's a development. But the same thing with business. When you build a business, you're going to look. They're going to be looking to locate residential areas for their employees. It's the same thing. I mean, things gravitate. You you build something. It's like you build it, they'll come. It's that rationale. And at some point in time, it does become an economic issue. And and the question really is, is that, okay, so you you want to bring jobs, but you gotta you gotta maintain the city, both economically and ecologically. And the ecology is a huge issue. And, and, and in speaking to that, and we talked a little bit about sea level rise in Bangladesh. Well, right now I'm on the uh, regional uh, council uh, institute uh, committee on sea level rise. So how do you tell a person that they can't build on the coast, knowing that you're going to see sea level rise two to three feet in about 50 years, and the property value is going to drop? Opposite. You can't keep re-nourishing. I mean, it, it is a lose-lose proposition to keep re-nourishing the beach because the reality is it's it's going away. It, it's moving. And so, so what do you do? I mean, how do you do these these rational plans, knowing that you're seeing the trends? I mean, the, we the Army Corps of Engineers has monitoring buoys. They're watching it. They, you know, this is not a panacea. They're actually watching the curve and they're, they're actually looking real time with the monitoring buoys and say, yeah, it's following this part of the curve. And so we, we kind of know that. What do you what do you say to a developer that says, "Well, you know, I'm going to bring somebody in." It, it's funny. The NPR a while back had a, a story about this in Miami. Miami has a huge issue with that right now. Uh, it's actually starting to flood over in North Miami Beach, and they're, they're wrestling with this right now. They're looking to be a little more aggressive, and they have to be. But um, the, they were talking to a realtor about selling property, oceanfront property, and the comment was, "Well, do you, do you tell? It's the ethics of the sale." Do you tell the potential owner, the owner that his house might be underwater in a few decades? Well, yeah, but it, it, he'll probably be gone by then. And, and there's a phrase in sustainability called the IBG, YBG. I'll be gone, you'll be gone. It's almost like highly a, fat, a, a bad style. Let, let's, let's kick that for just a second, where, where, where we, and I also want to get back to desal, but, uh, but let, let, no, let's, let's stick with you for a sec. The, um, I, I think, if you can't stop somebody from building on their land near the beach, what you can do is not bail them out when the flood hits. And this is very, very harsh, but we take a look at New Jersey or we take a look at the earthquakes in San Francisco. I mean, we know there's a big quake coming out there and the government in New Orleans, you know, that's, that's, that's underwater for crying out loud. So, so it's really the after the fact issue that I think is more problematic. Um, but as Americans, we're here to help fellow Americans. Um, but and I guess it's circled back again to the planning and the property rights issue. You know, and, and as to Palencia, Palencia didn't 
move the people here, they responded to a demand. It's, the, it's that thousand people a day that were coming to Florida and they had to have a place to live. They speculated on the demand. Well, um, they won. <laughs> well, not, not quite yet. They're still working on it. I mean, they really don't have the obviously rates they want yet. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a part of sustainability. But they're going to win. Uh, you know, I mean, but, well, but, but, but the premise you know, is, the premise is they don't create the demand. But the trick is, and here, here it is, if you look at it in today's lenses, you might be right. But let's say that you do have toll roads. And let's say that your gas prices are going up. And let's say they start to hurt every time they start seeing their patients going their direction. Is Plancy going to build out? I think, I think the jury's still out on that. You really don't know. Uh, the, the problem, um, and I, I mentioned about a while back about sustainability being a cultural issue. Part of the problem with us is in the United States versus, I'd say, in Europe, we're short term goal oriented. And if you go to Europe, they're long term. Uh, we, it gets down to how we look at stocks, quarterly reports from businesses, and all that stuff. Very, very short term. And, and, I, and I think that goes back even in terms of our planning. It's what gives our, our return on investment, how, how we talk highest and best use. For a building, you know, it's usually economic. I mean, I, you know, we were doing the, you know, the, the master planning for uh, Cecil Commerce. Every every piece of land we we're looking at for highest and best use economically. Oh, but by the way, that's a high grade water, wetland area. Yeah, no, but it's a corner, so it's high and best use. Well, yeah, but you're you're changing the watershed. Yeah, but you know, we won't worry about that. We, we're going to be able to engineer our way out of the problem. And sometimes you find out you can't always engineer your way out of the problem. But don't regu doesn't regulation with regards to wetlands deal with that issue? That, you, that, that if you wanted to destroy a wetland, you, especially if it's a recharge area, that you pay one heck of a premium that but makes you, it, in most cases, financially unreasonable. I, th I think you know and I know that a good developer gets around those kind of issues. I mean, it's, it's happened in the past. I've seen it. So. Well, that's it. Rodney, you want to react as, uh, yeah. as the corporate investor and the... Uh, no, I mean, just just interesting. I mean, just just about the comment about the developments and all that. I mean, isn't it fair to say? And again, I, I don't have any political background, whatever. But the counties are somewhat in cahoots, right? Because the real estate taxes, you know, in those areas, in particular, you talk about the coastal areas. I mean, that's where the premium, you know, uh, uh, real estate tax. The other thing too, if you've got private enterprise, you've got insurance companies. So I'm talking about the private ones. I'm not talking about the, the state backed ones in in Florida. Where you know, as long as you're willing to pay, you know, you get you get the insurance. So you know, that would be from a private enterprise standpoint. I said, look, I'm, I'm basically covered uh, from an insurance standpoint, and so I don't care if I'm not around and you're not around. My heirs will be just fine. You know, I mean, as long as the credit rating of the insurance company uh, retains its, its status. Obviously, if you have a lot of people going at the same time, you may have a collection problem uh, with that particular with that particular insurance company. Well, in reality, we do have an insurance issue in Florida on property. Right. The insurance company is very, very wary about sale orders. They, they know about it. Their actuaries right. are really clutching the numbers now yeah. as we speak. Well, let's, let's work with I'm on a property and casualty insurance company firm, and, and, and they're not in the business to lose money. Right. So what they're doing is charging enough premium, banking enough reserves for a 250-year storm, um, and so it's a that that's a zero-sum game in some ways you know I mean that the person buying the insurance is betting they're not going to have their house blown down or flooded the insurance company uh, or, or the, they, they are the insurance company betting that they're playing the odds in a way that's going to allow them to build up reserves so the market kind of dictates that a little bit I think that when the market is skewed can be by the counties as Rodney a, 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 a word to it could be the federal government bailing everybody out after a crisis that we skew the market and we take away the risks. Well, the other piece to all of these things, again, I think that the, the challenge is to recognize that all of these issues, economic, um, technical, um, around you know, the use of the environment, uh, are all part of a human system. And so we create regulations, we create markets, uh, we create technologies. And so I think ultimately some of these issues need to be addressed because there's an urgency and immediacy. But I think the you know there's a, a big challenge, and part of that is as, as you know as we educate both the population and, and as we educate as an institution, uh, is to help students to understand the difference between self-interest and self-gratification. And and I think that's one of the difficulties is we 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 kind of get stuck in the immediacy, short-term perspective, 
where the, you know, part of the challenge is also thinking that the long term, the seventh generation uh, kind of concept uh, is, is uh, equally important to be part of our thinking because ultimately all of this is, whether it's a technical adjustment, you know, we're going we're gonna to desalinate that in an efficient way that makes it cost effective. Uh, all of those are just technical issues. What we really need to also be looking at is adaptively. How are we going to adapt ourselves and our systems to these realities? I want to touch on that because you finally gave my segue. It's something Jeff has been wanting me to do for a while. You know, as an architect, um, I was trained to think a certain way, as, as an attorney does. I, I'm a generalist, and I, I, I look at a problem for a very large side of my way, way in. My, my consultants are linear and all that stuff. So I'm trained to think in a certain way. I've got my own jargon, just like you got, and all that stuff. And, and, but we're finding out, for the most part, sustainability is, it, the, the term is a, it's a wicked problem. And it's not wicked not because it's evil, it's wicked because it's, it's, as we mentioned before, it's interdisciplinary, it's multidisciplinary. What that implies is it crosses various professional realms. And I think for the university, if you deal with sustainability, you're going to have to be able to get a collaborative effort between the various colleges and, and, and have them te talk to each other and realize that that engineer thinks a certain way, somebody from the School of Business thinks a certain way, and, and do a collaborative effort, so, which is a real world, by the way. I think that is a really good venue to teach a quality education. We talk about quality education, with traditional versus a non-traditional approach. How do, you, how do you actually graduate a quality student? Um, when I was getting back uh, from the Dominican Republic about eight years ago, uh, Jeff, Dr. Michael, and I got together and we talked about the fact that sustainable projects in, in developing countries are wicked. And wouldn't it be neat to be able to combine the resources of various colleges together to work with the students to work on a problem in a developing country? Um, you know, the idea basically is it's, it's not just an engineering problem, it's a public health problem. It's not only a public health problem because of the cultural issues, it's an education problem. It's an economic, it's, a, it's an economic problem because you started talking about uh, it, uh, basically empowering and, and getting that program to get some sort of scale in the country. Um, what's happening right now is, uh, we, we, uh, you all might be familiar, there was a uh, few containers that went out from the University of North Florida, one went to Paranao in the Dominican Republic, that was a computer lab. I helped uh, Juan Carlos Viatoro with that, and another one to Chile. Uh, and, we have another opportunity coming up right now, and, and what's really exciting is that there is a donor that's very interested in an aquaponics project. He's a local, and he's more interested in the aquaponics project being something that provides a living produce market, if you will, for a local market, local food, um, to the point that he might give money to the university to, to pursue this. And, and wouldn't it be neat to me if if we take that model and combine colleges to look at it not as an engineering problem or an issue of hydrology and all that stuff, but a business model, is it business, is it, is it economically viable? Is it the constructability of the issue? Is it construct and maybe from that element, if it works on a local side, what would it take to move that in a developing country format? Not to say that we're gonna go push the, the solution but if there's pull, we have a, a viable program for that on the demand side. And, and I think that on, for the university, if you were able to have an inter, a required introductory course for all, all the colleges on sustainability, um, part of and Jeff, uh, to, to talk about basic issues, just, just as an intro, let them do their basic court courses. They need to get these, things, these courses done to finish their degree, but then let them come back when they do their final papers and their final projects and work together in a collaborative effort and see the interdisciplinary approach. If it's an engineering student, he begins to understand what the economic viability is of, of, of what he's doing. Is, is this thing really marketable? You know, those kind of elements. And I think when you do that, what you do with your students is you train them to go out into the world and work in a world that does, you have people that do speak different languages. Have going. I think that's a tremendous opportunity. So I think right now we have a an opportunity in front of us. Where we're going to see them tomorrow, the the potential donor tomorrow. And uh, if this thing works out really well uh, between Dr. Lambert, uh, uh, Dr. Michael, and myself, and a few other individuals, the idea basically is is, to, to, is this something that you develop a core program? 
And, 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 and a cycle did, there's an, also another opportunity I, I mentioned that I do with working in developing countries. I'm going to do my plug here. Um, if there's a summit program where you go into a developing country and really understand real world issues, and I'll use Haiti. I've got a friend, I got a, a group that I'm really close to called the Acronymous CODEP. They do a reforestation project, which is actually for those in, in the know, it's a vertical a garden approach to reforesting the mountains that provide not only uh, uh, empowerment for the, low, the landowners, but also provides food, it provides biodiversity, because once you basically provide the, the landscape back, you find out the, the animals come back, the flora and the fauna come back into it. it uh, they're tied to an NGO called Building Goodness. And Building Goodness is a construction one, so you have a school of construction that gets involved with a group in a sustainable area that's doing sustainable construction. I mean, they're, they're out of the box. And things that I do, I, I dream about getting put into projects, whether they're, we call living machines or bio, you know, on-site bioreactions to uh, handling uh, uh, um, black water, wastewater. Uh, getting those involved, uh, there's an aquaculture element, there's a, um, a um, urban gardening element with them. There is another one, and are you, are you, you remember Rotary Jackson? Or no? Honorary. Yeah. Do you know Michael Fisher? Heard of Michael? I've got, I've got another good friend of mine that's tied to a, an NGO in, in, um, in Haiti called Fancose. It's a microfinancing NGO. And for students that are in the School of Business and Economics, to understand the economics of working in a developing country. And oh, by the way, their reality on the economic side is totally different than yours. Their reality, and, and, learn, and learn that from the ground up. Really, really, truly really understand. And, by, and in their microeconomic program, there is a social element and an educational element. So what would be really cool is a, the group called CODEP has a dormitory set up. They, are off, they, they have to be off the grid. They're off the grid. There's no grid. And there's a setting to allow students from different disciplines to get together and discuss issues on sustainability. Oh, I should also mention that uh, on the public health side, uh, the Fon Jose groups is tied to a doctor that's well known internationally. Uh, he's got a, a one of a real, Dr. Paul Farmer. He provides public health for the people involved in Fon Jose's uh, program in the, on the northern plateau. So it'd be really cool to, to start at a, uh, an introductory level, let them do the core elements, offer a program that gets them involved looking at multidisciplinary problems and how you work with developing countries. I was, that's, so I'm really into developing countries. But then bring them back again on their final projects and, and, and get them back together and look at a problem from different avenues. And I think by doing that, you're really truly training your student to begin to think like, really understand world, real world problems. Well, and again, some of the questions I'm having, I'm just trying to devil's advocate a little bit. And um, obviously, the, the, the reason this is going on is because it's a support, support for sustainability. Um, but I'd like to draw you into this a little bit, Rodney, um, um, to talk kind of about the marketplace. Um, at UNF, we can build a building and pay a premium because the building's going to be there forever. And we can take a 50-year payback on lowered electrical or water use, or a 100-year payback, or a 150-year payback. Um, some corporations are adding chief sustainability officers who are, I'm assuming, by and large, looking for uh, uh, sustainability items that have a savings, but not necessarily a cost. Uh, you've been the CEO of Deutsche Bank for Central America, so you've got a bottom line that you have to produce. Uh, where, where is the corporate responsibility there, and where is their duty to responding to marketplace needs and the need to try to make a profit for shareholders? How do those, how do those connect? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question, and of course, it, it's, it's a balancing act, isn't it? They don't necessarily have to be in conflict. I mean, at the end of the day, you might, you're going to be able to find, uh, you know, one of the other speakers here mentioned about the sort of three circles and that little sweet spot. Well, that's exactly what you try to focus on. You try to focus on ways where you can have economic sustainability and at the same time, you know, have increased profitability. They don't necessarily have to be in, in, in conflict. And, and corporate, like the example I gave um, of that company in, in, in Brazil, I mean, a lot of the things that they do, both from a social responsibility and also from a sustainability standpoint, is in direct interest to their, to their, to their profitability. So what is happening more and more is, A, the pressure is coming from the shareholders. 
and then you go to the board of directors and, and senior management. I mean, it's basically a, a, uh, a joint effort to find those sweet spots and try to integrate as much as you can so that you have, you are at the end of the day doing the right things from an economic standpoint to your shareholders, but at the same time you have that social, social responsibility. So it's not that much of a conflict. I mean, there is that, that famous sweet spot. But the priority is the critical issue. At the end of the day, it's got to come from the top, you know, the direction. I mean, I know like Bank of America today, um, just because I'm, I'm familiar with some of the, the things that they're doing, they have two board members uh, who are very focused on sustainability. And so that puts an inordinate amount of pressure on the CEO to make sure that if that company is going ahead and making loans in Indonesia, for example, or in Brazil, right, where you have the, 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 the tropical forest, that it is, you know, a, a, a company that is doing all the right things in that respect. Otherwise, they won't, they won't lend. I mean, this company that I'm associated with, I mean, we had to go into so many hoops in order to get this financing because we had to demonstrate not only currently, but going back a period of time, you know, that we were abiding by all the rules and the regulations and that some of the key NGOs that sort of focus uh, on the company give the right, you know, certificates and whatnot that they can they can go ahead and, and, and apply for the finances. So the pressure is certainly coming there. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not only limited to uh, you know to, to the consumer end side. I think employees, uh, the younger generation is putting a huge amount of pressure on, on companies. I mean that is an important value for them and if they're gonna be associated with with uh, you know, with a company, they want to make sure that the company's doing the right things. I mean, we're a small company here in, uh, in Jacksonville, in Point of Fever, but the young uh, folks that we are, some of them from UNF, by the way, uh, those are the questions that they ask. You know, I mean, it's, it's in the first round of interviews they, they, they bring that topic up. So I, I don't think they're picking on us. I think this is pretty broad across the well, Rhodes, I think you, you kind of defined that sweet spot and we're going to go to some questions from the audience in just a minute, so get thinking them up. I'll point on somebody if nobody asks. Oh, the first one's always the hardest to get going, but, um, but the sweet spot is almost by definition fairly small. Clearly, you want to color that all in if you can with your sustainability efforts and the, and, and the work of uh, employees that are focused on that. What happens when a company fills in that sweet spot? Has done all they can. At what point do you start to say, how do we, how do we get that a little bit bigger? Uh, when, do, when, when are we willing to kind of nibble away at profits uh, to do a, a, a noble thing? I'm glad you got that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably better directed towards an economist rather than an ecologist. <laughs> well, just think of your company. I mean, you know, if you're flying all over the world, you're, you're burning up a lot of fuel. Um, at what point do you say, uh, uh, you know, I go by rail or I uh, hitchhike or, you know, I mean, what, what, everybody, every company has an opportunity to deal with this issue. Well, uh, this may be a, a little oblique, um, but what I, what I have seen is, is people that are truly interested in sustainability um, are willing to back off on um, profitability to make the other pieces work. Um, the, 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 the big picture is, um, is more important than, than profitability and I, and I think one of, the, one of the paradigms that makes this somewhat difficult and maybe it's our culture here in America is that economics really drives a lot of stuff and, and maybe it's a major driving factor and um, in the majority of our business, we do a lot of work with private developers um, and the dollar and how much can I squeeze out of a piece of land uh, and how far can the dollar go and how much can I make is, is really what it's all about. Um, but in, in sustainability, it's not. It's just trying to make uh, all the other pieces work so that you have balance. And so um, I have experienced on my staff um, in different generation, the, the younger generation is certainly more attuned to this and less attuned to, to money and um, 
more attuned to conservation and doing things uh, wisely and in, in a more sustainable way and it keeps pressure on me which is good um, and, and I've had to do things differently because of, uh, of them um, but we, we think about um, uh, different ways to do things and going paperless is, is one we're not all the way there but we're trying um, carpooling uh, is one uh, that we do. We recycle a lot of things and, and lots of businesses are doing that. There's still a lot that are not. Um, and we encourage uh, our staff to come up with ideas uh, for the business that we can apply and do things uh, more efficiently. Uh, we work with the temperature uh, in the buildings and everybody's willing to do that. They got to take off neckties and uh, wear uh, polo shirts uh, as part of that, so that was welcomed. Um, so it, it occurs in, in lots of little ways, but uh, every, every little way that's done in lots of places uh, adds up and it's all part of the formula. Can I take a shot? Yeah, go ahead. Why? And then we'll start to go out to the audience. Mm -hmm. just, just, just real quick, uh, you know, you mentioned how to increase that, that, little, that little circle. I'm going to go back to the example of this company in Brazil that I'm associated with. Uh, because I think that's where creativity and technology comes in in the big time, you know, particularly innovation. So just a very simple example. Uh, one of the reasons why they have they bought the land in Brazil, and, and that's where the, the basis of the operations is, is because it takes about six years, given climate conditions, for an eucalyptus tree to grow, as compared to maybe 15, 20 in the northern hemisphere. So that's sort of the, the carrot. Well, what happens is, uh, there, there are two factors, of course, that are very critical there. That's the rainfall, very, very critical. So if there are ways that during the, uh, the rain season they can preserve that water and extend that time, the productivity goes up. But the other thing that the productivity goes up, and they've done, they have a, a whole lab that's totally dedicated to that, is to try to increase the growth cycle of the tree so they can go from six years to five, or five years to four, you know, there again, you're using less less land because the rotation is, is much greater and you're getting, you know, better economic profit. So that's just a, a very simple example of where they're expanding that little that little so You can hand it over to Rob, but then just comment, but what dr drove that was less philanthropy and concern with sustainability than profit. And that's why I was just trying to get the bright line between, you know, what, 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 what drives a lot of creativity, frankly, is the profit motive or innovation in the business world because there's a reward for it. So where do we get the shading? You know, some companies are better at saying we're going to give away a certain percentage of our profits or willing, we're willing to reduce our profits because of a noble good. Just trying to find a way to it'll put, put the light on that up here. So, Rob, go ahead. I uh, really have kind of chiming about the issue of the economics and the profits really. You know, for the longest time we've uh, judged success by GDP, gross domestic product, right? Well, there's a new indicator coming out, and actually they're, they're, they're reevaluating. I'm sure a lot of you all, part of it, as you know about this, the GDP does not uh, take into account externalities. You know, the other things that happen affect that bottom line. And, and right now, and I, you know, I think it was on NPR today, they talked about the happiness index. And the rationale basically is, is it really truly profit that drives one's happiness? And, and I can almost argue that the United States, by and large as a culture, we're a, a quantity of life culture. And if you go into Europe, you're a quality of life culture. And what that basically means, we like to get stuff. We, and as an architect, I'll give you a great example, John. Uh, doing preservation work, you go in Springfield, you see the size of the closets and the bedrooms, very, very small. That's, what our, that's basically what our, um, our grandparents had. The neatest thing about it, if you ever look at a house today, and you see the size of the closets there, huge. And oh, by the way, have you been looking at the landscape lately? You see the, the, the latest craze of building multi-level mini warehouses for our stuff. Because we've been taught as a consumer society that we must buy to be happy. And what they're finding out, a lot of these charts, a lot of sociologists do this, is that you know, ever since they've talked about I think it was the uh, post World War II about um, that we must have this, this consumer mentality. Our happiness sort of started going down. We started having this this thing go up on the profits, but are we really happy? No, it was actually kind of going down. So in a way, we're really uh, as a society. If, if you compare us to somebody from Europe, they see it right off the bat. We don't see it because we're sort of in the woods. 
But you talk to somebody from Europe or from another country and they look at us and go, man, you guys, it's a lot of crazy lifestyle. So I think what you're seeing in the younger generations are questioning a lot of our values in terms of what is success. And it's not necessarily financially driven. Well, that was that was interesting. We'll toss them out to the audience. You guys had me everywhere except turning the thermostat down in the summer. I can't get there. But it's a, uh, yeah, we'll go with Josh first. Anybody want to react to it? More of an observation than a question, but the yes. always, unfortunately. <laughs> As we age, you get that benefit. <laughs> I think the problem here is we have a very limited amount of time. Do you want do you want to sit down and strap yourself in for a few days and we can really seriously talk about a lot of the issues regarding sustainability? And, and, and part of it really is, is how fast, you know, there is a wall. We all know we're running towards a wall. The question really is how fast are we going to be running when we hit that wall? And, and, and really, do we have um, the cultural paradigm to slow ourselves down? Uh, right now, it, it goes against our grain. It goes against who we are, who, what we're taught to be. We see it on, you get on, you turn the TV on, you're taught to buy. And we're, it's all about buy, use, waste. It's a very linear process, and that's, but that's what we're taught to do. I mean, in my education as an architect, part, part of it was, and we were talking a little about the, the, the various corporations, uh, there was, I was taught obsolescence, whether it's functional obsolescence or technological obsolescence, how fast will I get a return on investment, an investment for my client where you can throw that building away. That building could be sustainable uh, or it could be disposable. Uh, and, and with a lot of my bank clients, that's the way it was because trends change. Bank, the nature of banking changes. And we're going to throw that thing away. If you look at Europe, you talk about throwing things away. Oh my gosh, they go nuts because they look at a building and they look for building not just for its, its primary use, but potentially secondary uses and things like that. Here in the United States, we don't, we don't do that. And so there's a lot of issues regarding uh, the cult culture. And what you're really talking about is cultural issues, and that's a huge issue for us in the United States, more so than a lot of other people in the world, definitely you know, than people in the developing countries. So. Yeah, I think I read somewhere that McDonald's uh you have to renovate the store every seven years and do a near teardown every 14. That's just kind of built into the franchise. Yeah? Um, I don't mean to throw a fly in the ointment, but um, I almost wonder I almost wonder when I look at this, a little bit of hypocrisy. Whereas, is sustainability pretty much a developed country's way of looking at it. You know, as Josh just said, you know, he brought up all these points, but he's going to go home to his home, um, have dinner with his family, as we all are at the end of the day. You start looking at these countries in Africa and South America, and um, they're just trying to make it through the day, um, you know, every, with all the other third world issues that they have. It only seems like those countries go the sustainability route when it's sponsored by a developing country. Like an NGO. Exactly. So my point is, is, I want you to see if you can look maybe 40, 50 years into the future as you have the developed countries really pushing the sustainability. Um, 
do the lesser developed countries, like the Nigerias of the world, do they actually start um, catching up? Where do you see that difference breaking apart between the haves of this world and the have-nots? And, and, and again, like you said, we're grown up. But as we grew up in the 18 and 1900s, we were doing the same things that the Chinas and the Africans and the South Americans are doing, trying to get where we are now. Um, it, it's just an interesting paradigm. I think that's why I tried to allude to, yes, to that. With, uh, with the rainforest, as you've got that they're starving, trying to provide for the families, and we kind of arrogantly say, don't do what we did, which was to wipe out the entire eastern yeah. timberland. But, and, 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 what, and what did it get us? It, 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 it got us doing what we did, got us to be one of the biggest global economic powers in the history of man in terms yeah. of affluence. Yes. And then now we're restricting others from doing that. It's yeah. just a very interesting point of view. But look, 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 one other example of that, and then I'll kick over. One other example of that would be uh, where we're demanding environmental compliance in countries where we weren't doing it up until 1972. So, so we're forcing them to make products that cost more, or you end up with what's going on with Beijing and China, which is you can't breathe. You know, so now they're having to go back and retrofit. But yeah, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to add. I, I, you know, I, I think there is a, a degree of challenge for us of whether the kind of lifestyle we've uh, accumulated in the West is sustainable uh, globally. But I, I do want to also point out that there are some significant sustainable sustainability issues. Uh, in developing countries. And I want to just say one, share one personal story. I happened to be with a group of students in a little uh, village called Nubu Village, which is uh, just northwest of Kasumu in, in Kenya. And it's uh, right by Lake Victoria, so it's probably one of the, play, the oldest places where humanity existed. And because I was the old guy in the group, um, my job was to sit with the elders uh, as we were greeted in the community. And I noticed one of the things as I walked into the community that I saw a lot of you know, boys, you know, 10, 11, 14, and that I didn't see any boys until they were about 40, 45, or 50. And as we were talking in the, uh, I was talking with the elders of the community, they were asking me questions about uh, you know, how to you know, produce uh, higher yields with their bananas because they were in the middle of a drought cycle. And I, you know, all they knew I was from a university. I guess they assumed that because I was from a university that my degree in theology was going to somehow miraculously answer their questions about you know, drought conditions. But I, I asked um, my translator uh, for a little help and a little context. And uh, the, the issue was that what has happened in this village is the reason why there are no males between 14 and 40 is because they're all dead from AIDS. And the knowledge about how to deal with drought was encoded in the generation that no longer exists. That's a huge sustainability issue. In my, in my world, it would be a bar joke where I would get on my phone and Google how, you know, how to deal with banana plants and drought. But that's a real, incredibly important sustainability issue, not simply because what about the rain? But it's also about the technology transfer. What we assume is our technology, and theirs is an intergenerational. So I, I have to agree with this gentleman. I, I, I think the issue here is not just proactive, which I, for me is adaptive change. Uh, reactive is technical change. We can create technical fixes in the short term, and we have to. But that's not going to solve it. I just want to offer an observation. I think I uh, agree with you in in general about our imposition on developing countries, but it, it's not totally true. Uh, and, and I'll just use the Kyoto Agreement uh, on um, uh, atmospheric emissions. The two biggest emitters in the world the United States and China are the two that would not sign the agreement and all the other emerging countries were willing to jump on the bandwagon and do something we've not, we're not as leaders. Um, my staff has offered me just anecdotal stuff from going into uh, some of the third world countries and part of what they do is they, they go out into the bush where these projects are 
happening and then they're they're impressed in what is happening in peasant villages with use of resources. They don't have much, but they maximize what they do and they're efficient and they're they're not we're consumptive. <laughs> We've got a lot of money, it's easy to use it and throw away. They don't have much and they get they, they maximize it. We probably can learn a lot from them. Um, so it, I think it just adds to the complexity. It is really a complex issue, and uh, everywhere you go, it's just a different mix. Yes, in the back. Yes. Um, one of the things that um, I think many of these uh, issues have in common is that they are a common property resource. And so one of the things that we know about common property resources is tragedy of the commons. They tend to get overutilized. One of the things that I really haven't heard much about is government regulation because one way that government can step in is that they can change the prices of these resources. If we can change the prices, for instance, of the resources, say, of carbon, then we can let the free market go wild developing new technologies. We don't have to point our fingers saying, well, this person is, is greedy or this person is less greedy. The free market takes over developing new technologies and new ways to deal with it. Um, I, would, I would probably argue one of the key problems is that government is less effective because businesses are writing the regulations behind it. Therefore, we don't seem to make much progress with these common property resources, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, did, I, I was trying to touch on that as well, really in the water context, that, that we're really the reverse. We're giving that away and we're not charging a market rate for the water, which would encourage encourage different usages and, and with carbon of course that, that's another way to go at it. Um, it's not really free market once the government comes in and sets a price but it's a way to regulate it. Yeah. Any of y'all want to react to that? Or Parvez I guess wants to react to that? Well, yeah, there's a reason why lesser developed countries are more worried about climate change and global warming than we are. When I was in Bangladesh doing my full right work, this is the statistic that confronted me that Rob was talking about, sea levels rise three feet. 20 million people in the country of Bangladesh will be displaced. That's the entire city of Um It is unfathomable, for, and of course, the responsibility falls disproportionately on our shoulders, because we are 5% of the world population and we produce 20% of the carbon dioxide. Uh, so we are leading, uh, and, and, but now we see an interesting shift, as Rob talked about, that China not signing the Kyoto Protocol, along with us, um, is now China is talking about cap and trade regulation because they can't do this in Beijing. So once people see, and as if you know, you're, you're moving towards the wall, the wall is there, everybody can see the wall. Um, and the sea levels rising in Bangladesh is less than 100 years, which means it is in the lifetime of our grandchildren that this will happen. It's not a question of if it will happen, it's a question of when it will happen. So we see the wall and we are, we are running towards it, and the only question is, are we going to have a soft landing or are we going to have a hard landing? Yeah. So it, it, it falls up for us. I mean, to, have, to have this point, it does, in my view, and this is why China is suddenly now talking about cap and trade. So governments have to step in because it is, you know, you can, the free market can innovate, but government doesn't provide the right set of incentives for that innovation. Yeah. What is really interesting is, you know, the comment about our grandkids. And it gets back to the IBG, YBG mentality, because it's very easy to put something off when it's not in my realm. We don't know if it's an IBG, YBG issue. And quite frankly, they're starting to find out, to some degree, that their, their uh, projections are off. But it's not because they're being too liberal with their projections. It's actually they're finding out that it might be worse, and they don't know all the externalities that they actually have multiplied through that curve. They know it's a curve, but they don't know the multiplier is. It's, the best example is the, um, the uh, Arctic, um, Arctic Circle melting, you know, and, and, and the, the various feedback loops that happens. We know the argument is, well, you know, we, we know that the Arctic is not going to impact sea level rise because, you know, the, the density of the ice, so air and all that stuff, and it really doesn't replace it. But, but once that goes, the albedo, the, the reflectivity, of that area changes radically. And now once you have a high albedo, a white surface that's reflecting the heat away, now you've got an absorptive, and oh, by the way, 
That's continuous to Greenland. And that's the feedback loop. Yes, you're right. The Arctic melting is not an issue to it by itself. But our problem is we have a tendency to look at things in silos. We, we go, well, it, it's, just that, it's just that. But we don't realize there are feedback loops that affect other things that have radical impact. So some of our multipliers, it, it might not be an IBG, YBG. It might be in our lifetime. We don't know yet. We're so, and, and quite frankly, a lot of people are saying that Bill McKibben's been writing books for a long time on, on this issue. McKibben finally wrote a new book. It's called Earth. Uh, it's Earth spelled with two A's instead of one. And the rationale is, I'm tired of screaming. We're changing. It's, it's done. We've gone past it. It's, it's happening now. Earth will not. Earth as we knew it in our childhood will never come back. And that's, that's really the premise of this book. Because of the fact that it, it's not necessarily our grandkids anymore. And we're starting to see that. We're starting to see the climate, the, the climate issues in the last of droughts, what have you. Yeah, it, uh, I was on the board of the Nature Conservancy and the head of scientists come in and says, even if we stopped emitting carbon dioxide, the inertia is still a problem within 60 years. It really is kind of frightening. Yeah? <laughs> but be it as it may, I think the basic discrepancy between the environmental policies between the U.S. and Europe is the fact that we are getting, well, not we, because I can't really you know, rely on being a European any longer since we've been just as long as in the United States, but I believe it's because they are subsidized in, the, in Europe than they are in the United States. So if you are looking at like a sort of individual or portraying a specific environmental policy, then the, the Dutch government, for instance, which I'm familiar with, will actually pay towards you going into the green environment. For instance, if you want your water recycled, then they pay towards doing that. Unfortunately, the U.S. government doesn't pay you. You actually have to pay towards, even if you go into solar panels, it's about a $40,000 investment that you will never see back again. So I think if you really want to make a change, then don't shoot so much for the individual, try to convince the government. You know, the issue that you bring up is, is subsidizing. Yes. And, and you're right, they subsidize, but we do too. And what we subsidize is not exactly the sustainable elements. We sub subsidize highway construction. They subsidize public transportation. I mean, it's, it's really what is being incentivized and what's been disincentivized. And it's really an issue of policy on that part. We, we all subsidize something. I mean, so. Anybody else? We'll go to the very back. I'll get you next, AJ. Yeah, I think uh, what, what scares me a little bit is the, uh, the, the food situation. I mean, it's more common than the question. Okay, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the food situation on the planet. This came up weekly earlier. I think we're looking at uh, 9 billion people by 2050. And so it's a lot of synthetic crops that are being you know, developed just for this reason. And you talked about unintended consequences. I think there's a lot underlying that, that we don't know how this is going to affect the different uh, biosystems. And I think that is really scary. And we don't need to look to our grandkids. I think that will affect even us. I think the summary is the impact on the impact on agriculture, uh, both what's going on to us climactically, but also the massive population growth. Any anybody up here want to react to that? I'm going to hog this. Uh, it's interesting because even on the agricultural side, the unsustainability of it, it's not just population; it's all our agricultural practices. Uh, it's it gets down to our water usage, it also gets down to our use of topsoil. By, by our practices, that we're actually depleting our topsoil. There was a, uh, a comment that for every kilogram of, of corn that's grown, you lose a kilogram of topsoil. Mm -hmm. And it's really our, our, the way we, we do things. And it, it worked for us for a long time, but, but the way we're doing things now, it's really questionable. And, um, and I, I think the biggest problem is, is we have a tendency to import our technologies. Like I said, the Green Revolution in India was really us telling India how to grow like us. And as a result, they're losing their water resources rapidly. And so they're running into a problem. There's a lot of conversations about dust bowls being created in Africa and, and, and China. Right now, you were talking about Beijing. The last time I was in Beijing, there was a sandstorm from the Gobi Desert. So there's issues of desertification in, in, in that as well as in Africa. AJ? Yeah. Uh, my question is not, it's not global level or national level. It's more at the, uh, 
business on a corporate level. Thank you, Jeff. And probably best, uh, Rodney may be able to best handle this. Uh, I'm sure any of you could, but uh, I would suggest Rodney to try this question. We have large institutional investors, such as uh, TIA Cref or Calpers, who wield considerable influence on corporate boards. And uh, do you see increasing pressure from such institutional investors on corporate boards to follow business practices that are more sustainable in terms of environmentally friendly or socially responsible? Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, no question. I mean, not only these big players, but pension funds in general, uh, you know, are pushing very strongly in, in that arena and, and putting pressure on the boards. But they're also putting pressure on, on indirectly on firms like ourselves, you know, in terms of, you know, who we select to go ahead and invest in, you know, that abide by those uh, principles. Because they have so much leverage, not only in terms of the pressure on the boards and, and on the management, but of course, because of their very significant holdings, I mean, they can have a huge impact. If, for example, you know, they decide that that the particular company is not following those directives, even if they sort of decrease in relatively small amounts their holdings, it's going to have a huge impact uh, on the stock. And of course, there's the PR aspect as well, right, of them exiting or partially exiting of their investment. So the answer is yes. Bernie, what about when you're investing in a kind of an array of funds or in a where the individualized companies are kind of caught up in a bigger web. Um, how, how could you untangle those kinds of things? It's a little easier when it's an individual stock and you say this is a company we don't want to be a part of, but when it's a, a larger fund, it's a little more difficult to see exactly what they're holding on a given day. Yeah, and that's right. I mean, uh, you know, but so, some of the mutual funds, just, just to pick those, right, because I think that's what you're referring to, I mean, they come out with directives of basically stating what their principles are. And, and it's not only on sustainability. I mean, it's across, you know, there's some, uh, some religious themes, for example, the Catholic Church, uh, you know, uh, which we have one fund that, that we uh, invest in their behalf. I mean, they're very diligent in terms of what you can, you know, the sort of the non-sin, uh, you know, stock. So, so yes, I mean, there's much greater disclosure, transparency as a result of that. And so you're able to to pick, you know, what funds are mutual funds are doing the right things and what which ones are not. A, a, a related thing that we have seen is um, a lot of businesses are pushing sustainability backward into the supply chain and, and requiring that their suppliers also provide sustainable products. Um, and so they're not going to the cheapest, they're going to the people that are also practicing similar practices. And that's just, a, it, you know, it's a ripple effect and uh, it goes all the way through the economy. Yes, <laughs> another question. Um, <laughs> one of the things that um, Parvez um, and Doug Nosland, who together really championed the Sustainability Center, and kudos to our dean for following through with this, is they really did mention alongside what you said, sir, that Europe is so far ahead of us. The, the trains already left the station, I think, you know, pretty much throughout Europe on sustainability. They're, they're a lot further. My question is, how much of a challenge is it to teach people in the most individualistic culture in the world? Basically, I care about me, my family, my house. Don't really want to go to the neighborhood watch, but yeah, if that impacts me, I will go. It, it's almost like you were saying, you got to hit the sweet spot to show that the, it'll be profitable because profitability is better for me. If you still do this, you, you've got to basically bring it back to the individual to say, you know, it's going to impact you because it just seems as Americans, not that we don't care about the earth, but Kenya is so far away. Uh, it, it's hard for us to be world caring much more. It seems like we care about ourselves a lot more. And I go to Europe a lot and, and I see it literally as I come off the plane that we truly are much more individualistic, whereas they seem to be a little bit more collectivistic as an as a area there. But you have a different sort of political science orientation in America, it's still the most philanthropic 
philanthropic country in the world. It's just a question. They don't want the government making the call. They want the individuals to. I think your labeling of individualistic really goes right to the issue. Yeah. Well, uh, but I also I think it's a, it was a, a really great point because uh, here in the states we do have you know certain challenges that are part of our cultural challenge. But I think that's also why I would say that if we're going to be competitive, we want to man manage our uh, maintain a competitive advantage over others. You know, as you were saying about you know look at the trains already out of the station in terms of environmental sustainability. Uh, part of that, which is why I'm in the business, these gentlemen are fortunate enough to work with our graduates and, and faculty. Um, uh, but the reason why I'm in the business I'm in, which is in higher ed, is because the, the answer has to be a deep investment in trying to help students not only uh, be competent in their specialties, but to think deeply, uh, not only about themselves, who they are, to think deeply about the world and the impact they're going to make. And so th that's why I think it's, it's important to have panels that engage uh, all of us, because there are challenges that are short term that we can't turn our back on. There are also bigger cultural challenges is like how do we work with students uh, and how do we help them develop because that's one of the joys about, for me, about working in higher ed. Uh, we're working at a, a really incredibly uh, critical time of their lives. They're coming in, uh, they're, they're, they're emerging adulthood, uh, they're making choices. Uh, and if we can help them by the, helping them by what we make accessible for them to think, how we engage them in problem solving in real time, um, the, the areas of community-based learning, of, of inviting them to be in neighborhoods where perhaps they would never have been in before, um, meeting people that they never had to interact and work with before, um, that's what a public institution ought to be doing if we're thinking about what the new extension service needs to be. We need to be flipping the classroom. We need to be looking at how we're engaging community, how our, our colleagues in the community, our neighbors in the community, are also part of the content of their study as well. Let me go real quick. I, I, I work with a, a, a real good friend of mine that's involved in an NGO that does work in Brazil called InBend. And uh, again, it's, it's really a cultural training. What they do is they, they teach the kids. They teach the kids, and it's kind of about issues regarding water and sanitation. And, they, and being Brazilians, by the way, this is a Brazilian cultural thing. At the end, of, at the end of this educational experience, they have a carnival. So they, they, they go out, and they, they just dance in the streets, and life is good, and, they, and everybody in the village sees them do this, right? What is really neat about this, at the short term, the kids go back and they teach the parents. The long term is. They're changing generational cultural attitudes. So, and, they, they, and that's really part of their model, is that you teach the kids, the kids teach the older generation, and oh, by the way, you're re-educating that next generation. I, I was just going to add a brief, you know, uh, so we're not too, too hard on ourselves, uh, because I think, you know, the, 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 clearly the, the cultural, uh, you know, emphasis of the baby boomers, for example, has been sort of consumer, me, me, me. There's no, no question about it. But I, I really see light at the end of the tunnel. I see that younger generation uh, shifting away from a pursuit of happiness to wanting to be significant. And, and that's a big, big difference. They want to make a difference. And, and we see it, you know, even in our company, we see it because we, we have trust, you know, and, and we see the parents putting the younger generation, you know, on the board of those trusts. And the emphasis on the younger generation is very, very different than many of us, you know, in, in our generation. So uh, I, I just want to, you know, highlight this, this little light at the end of the tunnel there because it's, it's, it's moving in the right direction. I don't want to be repetitive, but I, I, I believe that we've got, to, we've got to start young and create the, the paradigm for a generation and started to talk about this when we get in college is, is, is not too late, but we should start earlier and uh, elementary school and imp implement some of this in our basic science uh, so that uh, the kids grow up and this is, this is the way that we live, we should live. That's a great wrap up with us four. We've come to the end of the session. Thanks for attending, thanks for the panelists. Uh, three of the four for coming to campus, but all four of you for appearing today, thank you.